This is Delta Launch Control. Go for launch. Three, three, two, two, one. Engine start and lift off. Good night, Oppie. Took us two years from the very first conversation at a dinner where the idea was hatched till we locked and delivered it to Amazon. So in my world, that's a relatively fast documentary. We inherited almost a thousand hours of archival footage from NASA of Opportunity's life, like from the moment she was just an idea in someone's head and then went up on the blackboard and then was built all the way uh, through her launch journey and her eventual death in 2019. My inner crew was the same size as it normally is, but because we were doing big visual effects with Industrial Light and Magic, there were hundreds alone of people in Industrial Light and Magic who worked on this, and the sound design uh, was quite big too. So I would say it was 300 plus people worked on this film. I think in the end, we have about 35 minutes of, of visual effects in the film. So those are the sequences that take place on Mars, but it takes so long to create those those visual effects that like almost every minute that we created ended up on screen. There were a few scenes that I think my producers were not very happy got cut in the end because they were very uh, time consuming and expensive to make, but just had to had to fall by the wayside by the end for the sake of the story. Our whole objective was to build two solar powered rovers that could survive three months on Mars. And the pressure on the team is really phenomenal was Mars once a green world with living things and, and blue oceans. In some other universe, someone would have tried to make a narrative feature of this and just recreate these two beings, robots. You did that, but you did it in the documentary world, which often is controversial. Can you talk about that decision to recreate them on the planet? I see Goodnight Oppie as a documentary through and through, mainly because of the process that we took to create those visual effects is completely steeped in reality. So each of these rovers had nine cameras on her. So we had hundreds of thousands of photographs of what this journey looked like, especially when our film is popping up for critical junctures in her life. So say opportunity gets stuck in quicksand. We knew what soul numbers those are. We can just tap into the computer and find all the imagery from those days. And you can basically lay it out as a time lapse, like a flip book. And then we also had hundreds of thousands of photos from the sky. So there's two orbiters that are satellites above Mars and they take what's called high rise photography and telemetry down on Mars of the robots journeys, but also of the terrain. And so the big question that I posed to Industrial Light and Magic when we partnered with them to do the visual effects was, can you take all of this information, this photography, this data from NASA, the weather every day, where the sun rose, where the sun set, how much, how much dust was in the air, which would affect the lighting of each scene. Can you take all of that and create a photo real Mars exactly like we know what it looks like because we have the photography. And they said, we've never built it from the ground up, but we're up for the challenge. And so I don't see them as recreations. I see them as a real documentary way of taking on visual effects. And I see that more and more in my colleagues' films, it's like, why not? Why can't documentary filmmakers have access to tools that have been in the toolkit of scripted filmmakers, you know, from the beginning of cinema? And I think when we have access to those things, when they help tell our story, and sometimes they might be unnecessary, often I think they're unnecessary, but when they help us tell a true story in documentary fashion, why is that seen as like really pushing the boundaries in some way and not just getting access to these tools that filmmakers have been using forever? Yeah, it's only a robot, but she becomes a family member. To every scientist that watched them for decades, those are living beings that just so happen to be robots. Did you see that same way once you were uh, shooting and actually going through all the archival footage? Once you start to watch down the thousand hours of archival and you start to create your visual effects, and especially once you start 
to do your interviews with people. And my interviews were like four or five hour long, really open ended interviews with these scientists and engineers. And the way you start thematically like collating stuff is we start to categorize things into sections. And sometimes that's very easy. It's like op opportunity getting stuck in quicksand. Every time someone tells that story, you put it in a string out. But sometimes we use very broad terms because they're more thematic. And one of the terms, it never appears in my film, but it goes to your question that we used to collate things was this idea of the circle of life. And I felt like that was a real theme to this film on so many levels. I mean, these robots are in a cycle, like they refer to per Perseverance, the current rover on Mars, as the granddaughter of Opportunity and Spirit and Curiosity, the other rover on Mars, as the daughter. And there is a real cycle of life to these rovers that when they die, whatever their scientific legacy is then picked up by the next rover. So Opportunity and Spirit, you know, discovered unequivocally that water had once existed on Mars. Well, then Curiosity had to take that baton and she was looking for the building blocks of life, like the next step to telling the story of whether Mars had been ever, ever been a habitable place. I really loved this idea of the relay race of knowledge, especially with scientists and engineers that might spend their entire lives working on, you know, a handful of missions. And two out of those three missions might have failed. You know, we know that the two missions that immediately predated Opportunity and Spirit were massive failures. Both spacecraft, one burned up in the sky and one, one crashed into the surface. They were seen as a huge public embarrassment to NASA, but they paved the way for Opportunity and Spirit to land. These people in my film that might not be alive anymore, it's their legacy, their, their technical legacy and the landing technology and how you operate these vehicles, but also the scientific legacy. I think there's a real selflessness to the way that they work in that these things that they're discovering will outlive them. They're for the better of mankind eventually. And I think that sounds really cheesy, but when you're in the middle of it and you feel it from these people, it's really inspirational. This is the very first time we breathe life into the rover. It's just a box of wires, right? But you end up with this cutish looking robot that has a face. Oh, it's alive! One of my favorite stories is related to my favorite scene of the film, and it's showing how timely Goodnight Oppie is uh, when she decides to take a selfie. And that scene almost made it on the cutting room floor. And I can't imagine a movie like this without it. Well, to be clear, I feel like almost every scene in a documentary at some point on, ends up on the cutting room floor. Like you have to be open to losing even your most favorite of moments in service of the story. And the story in the edit room is constantly amorphous. That's the fun of documentary editing. So everything is debated. And so I will say I was never on the side of cutting the selfie scene. And it is my favorite scene in the film. It really is because you reach the selfie, which they didn't take until year 14 in Opportunity's life. And she was barely working by that point. She has what they described as arthritis. Her photos weren't like her, her hard drive was working much slower. So it took forever to take a photo. And they were going to have to take 30 something images of her from her microscope that was on the edge of her arm and piece those blurry, out of focus, low grain uh, images together to create this like crappy selfie. And it was so important to them because they had never seen their robot on Mars, although they'd been seeing through her eyes for 14 years, they had never actually seen her, minus from a, a satellite way up in the atmosphere. And so they put science on hold for a few days. And why that's my favorite scene is I hope it's a reminder to the audience, like you've been on this beautiful journey, but like the people that loved this robot the most, this was the best that they ever got. Through this robot, we are on this incredible adventure together. You were able to call upon Mark Mangini, two-time Oscar-winning sound designer, re-recording mixer of Dune and Mad Max Fury Road. You got uh, Emmy winner Lake Neely doing your music. Can you just talk about uh, getting those two particularly on board? 
Yeah, what a dream. I mean, I've worked with Blake for a long time, and I'm very, I'm very lucky. My documentaries are like his little pet projects. And I had never worked with Mark Mangini before. But what I loved about the process with Mark, no matter how much of a legend Mark is in his world, he's like a kid in a candy store when it comes to sound. And that's why we wanted to work with Mark. My initial conversations, he had seen a rough version of the film and he was so excited and enthused to do something that he had never done before. I mean, he had created worlds like Mars in Dune and Mad Max Fury Road, the two that you cited. They both have massive dust storms in them. So it was very convenient. I probably had the leading expert in sandstorm sounds in the world. But what he said is like, but this is real. This is a documentary and I don't ever do documentaries. And if we're going to do this, I want this all derived from real sounds. And so working with Mark was um, was a surprise in the sense that it was no different than working with my any of my other collaborators on a doc where authenticity is what's front and foremost to them. At 40 feet, the back shell fires retro rockets slows the rover down to zero miles per hour, and then cuts the last cord. What is it about space exploration that brings people together? Why do people care so much about this? When we were little boys, E.T. felt like a totally real and true story to us. And I think space exploration is the embodiment of that. These ideas of like, things that when you're a little kid where you believe like, oh, I can I can play pretend and I can go to Mars. And then as whatever, for whatever reason, as adults, at least speaking personally, we lose those sensibilities. I know I had into my life and getting to make a film around people who get to actually live out those dreams every day was a way to restore that inner child in a lot of way, that imagination. And so I think there's something about exploring the unknown, right? Like we have charted most of Earth. We know where everything is at this point. And the idea that these, the motto of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is dare mighty things, and they are trying to achieve the impossible. And they've started to achieve some of those things that they were told were impossible. And like what restores that childlike sensibility more than actually seeing that happen in real life, in a documentary, this isn't sci-fi. This actually happened. It didn't come from my imagination. Some screenwriter didn't write it. The story actually happened. There's two rovers walking around Mars right now exploring, and one day, hopefully, humankind will be able to as well. Humans are capable of forming a connection and a bond to a robot. She rewrote the history books. Good night, Opportunity. Well done.